Model steam engines for beginners, part 19. Valve timing and valve gear. What the component parts are called and what they do. This engine that you're currently watching running is a very large model steam engine. At the guess I would say it was possibly an apprentice piece from a long time ago. I rebuilt this engine several years ago because it was in a bit of a state. Someone had drilled a hole right in the centre of the cylinder to fit an oiler and this was just destroying the valve packing. My solution was to make a cast iron sleeve for the steam cylinder that was thick enough to allow me to machine some grooves on the outside of the sleeves to let the oil through into the cylinder. There were many things wrong with this engine but when I put all the problems right it ran very well. Here's a video extract from the series where I explain about valve timing. Here I'm setting the valve position. The slide valve has to pass over the ports equally at both ends. The timing of the valve is down to the eccentric setting. What I need to aim for with this engine, as with all steam engines, is early admission. I need the valve to just crack as you can see here, letting steam or compressed air into the cylinder, just before the piston reaches top dead centre at each end of the cylinder. This early admission effectively cushions the piston and stops all the mechanical parts from overstressing at the end of their limits. If the valve is in the correct position over the ports, all you need to do is set the position of the eccentric relative to the crank pin. And I mean just before top dead centre, not like this, more like this. This would be about fine for the valve just to uncover the steam port to let the steam into the cylinder. It would be effectively cushioning the piston at each end of the stroke. And because the valve is equidistant, when you turn the crankshaft over, you will also see that the valve uncovers the other port when the piston is at the other end of the cylinder. So now with the valve set and the steam chest cover back on, I'll give it a run. This is very much the first run. Things are a little bit tight, but it's running very well. This flywheel, although it's not very well machined, is really heavy. And that's very good because the kinetic energy is there to pull the parts over top dead center. One of the main problems with slide valves, they're quite efficient, as far as steam engine valves go, and they tend to wear in, not wear out, because they're always pressed against the port face by the pressure of the steam, but they don't have to take a lot of moving. The pressure of the air or steam holding the valve against the port means that it requires quite a lot of force to move the valve. There are many other valve gear designs for steam engines. Locomotives generally use piston valves, although some of the earlier locomotives used slide valves. The slide valve is good for model use though because it's a fit and forget thing. We seldom give any trouble, provided of course they're lubricated, but that goes without saying. This is sort of a model of a mill engine. And an engine in a mill didn't really need to go in reverse. In fact, if it did go in reverse, it would cause problems in the factory. Normally, ropes from grooves in the flywheel would drive a large wheel which connected to counter shafts that ran overhead in just about every place where there was a machine. For instance, weaving looms. They needed to go in one direction. Or to make it simpler, I'm sure in a factory a grinding wheel would have been driven by overhead shafting, as would a lathe. And if the steam engine driving all this overhead shafting suddenly went in the opposite direction, think of the problems. The machinery would start to run backwards. Definitely not good for a grinding wheel or a lathe. It soon becomes apparent that if a steam engine is going to be used to drive things like traction engines, steam locomotives, or even steam boats, it's fairly essential that the engine is capable of reversing. This is a Stuart 5A steam engine, and it's a full-size steam engine, but it's just small. And it's more than capable of producing one and a half horsepower at 80 pounds of steam pressure, which is more than enough to power a 25 foot boat. This one is fitted with a water pump driven by an extra eccentric. You can hear the water that it's pumping gurgling in the background in this clip. Fitted to the crankshaft are eccentric sheaves with eccentric straps fitted to those. Both of the eccentric straps have eccentric rods which connect to an expansion link. 
That's the fancy shape curved piece that moves from side to side when you operate the reversing lever. And the good thing about steam engines, as I mentioned before, is you can reverse them under power almost instantaneously. And if you think about it, there aren't many machines that will allow this to happen. Imagine banging your car into reverse when it was moving forward or vice versa. Not very healthy for the engine, but this does not harm the engine in any way because suddenly the drive to the valve is changed from eccentric to eccentric and the eccentrics are set at 180 degrees to each other. Here are some of the parts of what's called Stevenson's link reversing gear. This is the expansion link which connects to the die block which in turn is bolted to the valve fork. There are quite a lot of reversing valve gear types for steam engines, most of them being named after the inventor. This clip shows a pair of eccentric straps which are bolted to a pair of eccentric rods. The part of the eccentric system that fits to the crankshaft, which is usually made from cast iron, is called the eccentric sheave. And here I'm assembling a strap onto a sheave. The eccentric sheave is held to the crankshaft using a grub screw. And what I normally do is drill a hole in the bottom eccentric strap so I can insert an allen key to adjust the position of the eccentric sheave on the crankshaft. This sets the valve timing. And here you can actually see the job in progress. The allen key is currently tightening the eccentric sheave onto the crankshaft. This is a much quicker way of doing the job than having to remove the eccentric straps to make any adjustments. In this clip I'm carrying out the first test fit of the parts just to make sure that they work and I'm using some brass machine screws for this. When I finish the engine I use proper steel pins. You must not use bolts of any kind to go through moving parts because the threads are not a very good bearing surface. Moving a bit further up, here's a slide valve in the steam chest and by rotating the crankshaft and adjusting the eccentrics I can make it so that the valve moves the same distance over the ports at each end. I rebuilt this 5A and fitted the reversing gear. It started off as a few rusty parts that I bought from a man in Cheltenham. This is literally the first test run and as you can see it's very encouraging. I sold this engine a while ago and as I think I explained in a previous episode I didn't want to sell it so I put a high price on it. Anyway the good news is the owner of the engine is emigrating and wants to sell me it back and I'm going to buy it too. I put quite a lot of blood sweat and tears into this engine as I made most of it. As I mentioned this is the first run and it was very encouraging. It got a lot better once it started to bed in. And this is one of the few steam engines of this type that I've worked on that was really happy with early admission. And when I ran it on steam, it was very economical with the amount of steam it consumed. In the past, a lot of the engines I've built and worked on are either from customers or part of my collection that I had to sell, particularly when I got a problem with the mortgage shortfall property repairs, car problems, the usual stuff. But now thankfully I got a divorce from my second wife, sold the house and I live by myself in a beautiful village in the East Riding of Yorkshire. Life is a lot more relaxing, that's why I can make a video almost every day. Sometimes, like at the moment though it's difficult, the studio is very busy, I'm doing my accounts for the HMRC, Inland Revenue or whatever you call it, and there aren't enough hours in a day, and I'm starting to feel a bit tired. I think it's time to have a bit of a nap. The black oil on the bench is easily wiped away, this is what comes out of an engine as it runs in. Initially most of the parts of the engine are not fully tightened. I always do it this way. The first run needs plenty of oil and the oil needs to penetrate the parts easily in order to lubricate every moving part and flush away the metal particles. And that is it for this video. I'm going to leave the engine running until the end of the video and look forward to getting it back this weekend. 
and I'll probably make a video about that too. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.